as we enter this uh, bull market, Raul, uh, you've seen your fair share of, of crypto cycles. Uh, this one's already um, manifesting differently. Uh, we Bitcoin passed all time high before the halvening, which is this like hallmark of like what a crypto cycle is. Like first the halvening happens and then Bitcoin hits all time high sometime like nine months later. Well, now that order is happening in reverse. Also, this Bitcoin ETF thing is like perhaps the reason why that's happening. Um, the, overall, there are some things about this particular bull market that are different. Uh, and this, I think, would be expected as time goes on and the crypto industry matures. Things are going to change. Like we can't be having this like four year, like 300 percent cycles over and over and over again. Like we have to like be less insane as an industry. Um, in order to get mainstream adoption. But overall, like, how are you, um, how would you characterize the flavor of this particular bull market as with the data that we've been able to have so far? So, you know, as I've <clears throat> spoken here before, this is all driven by the liquidity cycle. It's actually a macro cycle driven by mm -hmm. the refinancing of government debts because everybody reset interest rates to zero in 2008. They set their government debts all at three to five years, gives us a four year cycle. Mm -hmm. That was the exact point, uh, the launch of Bitcoin. It's also the US presidential election cycle. It's all the same thing. And election cycles, they give out candy to the kids, which is their way of stimulating. So it's all part of the stimulus cycle and debt for refi cycle. So I don't think that changes because the debt issue is still too big. Okay, so what is the nuance of the cycle? Normally... Normally, we've only got three data points, but the crypto spring, which is the first year after the bear market, this has been a strong one. You know, Bitcoin was up 150% or whatever. So that's pretty strong because we brought an extra source of demand in, as you allude to with the mm -hmm. ETF. But that actually came later, but it was front running by hedge funds and participants. Right. Us, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is that so, what we're in, by the way, now, Raul? Is crypto spring like the year? We're just after the transitioning to crypto summer, which is uh, okay. I'll come into in a sec. Okay. So, crypto spring transitions to crypto summer, and that's usually happens after the halving. And after the halving, you see something that I know everybody's getting shit for right now. Is if you go back to 2020, after the halving, what happened? ETH Bitcoin bottomed. Right. And then it started out, it's slowly based, and then it started out performing, right? That's when the market takes on risk and goes out the risk curve. And that's when you start to see Bitcoin dominance coming down, all of that kind of stuff. That's what the summer is. It's also altcoin season. It's when we hit what I commonly refer to as the banana zone, when everything goes bananas, <laughs> right? The bit of crypto magic. Now, this banana zone is interesting to me because we've got this new source of demand. This is the most reflexive market ever, because the more people join the network, the more the price goes up, the more it encourages people to join the network, the more the price goes up. And obviously that reflexivity works in reverse, which is why we get strong bear markets. But basically the world is underweight this asset because it's still a new asset and it's an adoption curve. So over time, more and more people join the network as investors or users. So I think we can see a second wave of panic into the Bitcoin ETF from people. You know, I was speaking to a good uh, friend of mine who's um, a kind of very well-known hedge fund manager, ex-hedge fund manager, and one of the, the billionaire crowd. And he's like, Raul, when do you think Bitcoin hits 100,000? I said, probably the summer you know, with the kind of demand and the ETF. It kind of feels like sometime in the summer. He's like, he's like, you know, so much wealth is getting made in crypto. It's making the billionaire class nervous. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> what? <laughs> and this was a lovely insight. He's like, okay, there's two groups here who all they care about, they're so rich, all they care about is where they fit on the rich table. Right, they can't be the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley guys, but right. there's this whole group that that compete with each other for how wealthy they are. It's, it's not like even the about scoreboard. returns anymore. Right. It's like a scoreboard. When, when you're in the status. top ten thousand, you can kind of count your way to the top and you really know exactly <laughs> where you are. And so he said they're all gonna panic that they're gonna lose relevancy. So they're gonna <laughs> panic in. 
they're going to panic into Bitcoin, you know, the Bill Ackmans of this world and, the, you know, all of these people. So I thought that was funny. But he also said the other group is the billionaire property developers. He goes, these guys are losing re relevancy fast because of commercial real estate. And these mm. guys have been lording it around, you know, Palm Beach and everything else as the kings of the hill. And they're worried about their relevancy because, you know, once you've once you're worth five billion dollars, you know it doesn't. It's not about. It's not a wealth game anymore. It's like, am I richer than my neighbour? That's all they care about. Um, and so he's like, you know, I think that they'll probably get involved as well. And I think that mindset is pretty true everywhere, right? People see Bitcoin going up, and then you hear that your mates you're playing golf or having a drink, and he made money in it, and then you think I've got to make money in it, and this is the reflexive loop. So that's what Crypto Summer is all about. It's the FOMO, the madness, the insanity that crypto becomes. But it also drives adoption, drives money into the VC again. It, it flushes money through the system, allows people to build new product, which is the next cycle's gains and all of this stuff. So that's great. And then we go into fall. And this is where the complications lie. Crypto fall, which we historically 2025, they've generally finished at the end of the year. We don't really ever know exactly. I think this cycle's maybe started a bit earlier. I don't know. And falls can be the most tricky part. This summer is the easy bit. You just shut up and do nothing. A number go up. Fall is tricky. So if you go back to 2013, we had a 50% sell-off. People thought it was done because it had already gone up, I don't know, 20x or something stupid. It then corrected... 50%, everyone thought it was over, and then it moon rocketed in a just a way you can't comprehend. Then you get to 2017, same. 2017, everyone kind of thought it was over early summer, and then it did, I don't know, 10x from there? It was bananas, right? That is really hard to deal with because 2021 was a stunted cycle. We never got the accelerated final leg. We had the huge correction. It went up, poked its nose back up in the highs, collapsed. Everyone's got PTSD from that. The real money was made in those previous two bull markets in terms of percentage returns. Everyone now assumes it can only go up 3x from the all-time high. There is actually no evidence of that. Maybe something was weird in the last cycle because the other ones did a lot past the all-time highs. So I, I'm slightly, so how I think of it is a distribution curve. Middle is, it kind of does what it's supposed to do until sometime mid H2, 2025, it tops out, okay? That would be normal. That would be Bitcoin as a price target of, call it 200,000, mm -hmm. something like that. You know, 3X, the all-time high kind of thing. That's, I would give a 60% probability. I think there's a 20% probability that people are calling this a left translated cycle, i.e. we brought forward demand because of the ETF. It dries up. We're overperforming for this stage in the cycle. I think people saying that tend to be one cycle people because they only saw the last cycle because others have outperformed earlier on. So anyway, okay, there's a 20% chance of that. Then there's a 20% chance that this turns into a full bone bubble cycle at 2013, 2017, because of this new dynamics. Mm. You throw in an ETH ETF as well. You throw in, you know, the $65 billion of VC that went into the last cycle. Somebody comes up with some killer applications. Before you know it, there's 200 million people playing a game. There's, you know, stuff like this going on. Okay, that could create something crazier. And I'm continually assessing these probabilities in my head. And because I, there's so many people who I've noted have PTSD from the last cycle, the stunted top, it's less translated, they're going to take it away from us, starts to move my probabilities that you get a correction and then a spike. You can't predict that because everyone's going to hate you if you're wrong. Like I got hated at the top last mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. by thinking we were going to have that. <laughs> Right. So it's it's like a it's and it's also very difficult to manage. So it's a it's complex, I would say, but we don't have to care this year.
which is love. If you enjoyed all of that, then you'll absolutely love the Bankless newsletter. Join over 300,000 fellow readers, all for free. Click below to sign up.